Hi, we are a group of Harvard and Yale researchers interested in the problem of cooperation, why people are willing to pay individual costs to benefit others. In this project, we investigated how to increase cooperation in the real world. Over the next five minutes, I'll summarize our review paper on the subject, recently featured on the New York Times op-ed page. In case that's too much time, here's one picture summarizing the whole thing, with a link to our paper below. Now, let's start with an example. According to the California Department of Water Resources, water year 2015 is the driest winter in California's written record. Images like these have flooded the news, showing the dramatic change in the Golden State's landscape over the past year. Suppose you're the governor of California, and you're faced with this historic drought. Your goal is to find effective, inexpensive, unobtrusive ways to encourage water conservation. One possible solution is to charge more for water. But, before you have a chance to implement this solution, you run into legal roadblocks. Even without political roadblocks, you might find that people aren't as responsive to changes in prices as you might expect. In a 2007 review of water price sensitivity, elasticity in economic terminology, Researchers found a 10% increase in price would yield, on average, only a 3-4% to reduction in water use. They noted that water was as insensitive to price as other basic resources, like gasoline. So what can be done to get people to be more cooperative? To find out, we synthesized the results of nearly 100 research studies that attempted to increase cooperative behavior across a wide range of settings. Not only water conservation, but also energy conservation, charitable giving, blood donation, and many others. There were many studies that tried to increase cooperative behavior using some kind of material reward. Changing the price of water is one such intervention, because it makes cooperating, in this case conserving water, more financially appealing. Other examples include giving away t-shirts, mugs, or the infamous tote bag as a reward for cooperation. Like our discussion of changing the price of water, we found that adding these perks do not often promote the desired change in behavior. There were also a number of studies that instead of giving material rewards to the person cooperating, tried to make cooperating more attractive by increasing the efficacy of giving. Some did this by offering a matching grant that made giving twice or three or four times as effective. Others did this simply by pointing out how easy cooperation is, or how effective it is. If you think that people are motivated to cooperate by the impact it has, then making cooperation more appealing in these ways should have a big impact. But we found pretty disappointing results. So, if the traditional approaches were not consistently effective, what did work well? What we found might surprise you. The types of interventions that were most consistently successful weren't based on money or prizes, but on leveraging people's social concerns. That is, concerns about what others think of you. What do we mean by this? Let me show you by walking through the two most common ways of tapping into social concerns. The first is to increase the observability of people's cooperative deeds. That way, you get more credit for being a good person when you act in a responsible way. Here's one example of how this has been done. Authors Yoeli and Rand put sign-up sheets for a blackout prevention program in apartment building mailrooms in Southern California. They found that including tenants' names, rather than just an identification number, triples sign-up rates. When our good deeds are observable, others can give us credit for them, and we're more likely to do those good deeds. Of course, this need not be conscious. We may just be more likely to feel the tug of our civic duty, say, when we pass by a public sign-up sheet and subconsciously imagine what our neighbors would think if we saw our name there. The second social concern is the reverse. Instead of telling others about your behavior, we tell you about theirs. Psychologists call this type of information descriptive norms. For example, electric utilities sometimes tell their customers how much electricity they're using relative to neighbors with similar homes. If your neighbors are more efficient than you are, you realize that your neighbors might expect you to conserve more too, and you might even feel compelled to do so. Again, this need not be happening at a conscious level. These kinds of interventions regularly achieve big effects, and they're cheap and relatively easy to implement. And therefore, if you were the governor of California, these kinds of interventions are where you might start your battle to increase water conservation. Okay, so social interventions seem to work more consistently than cost-benefit interventions. But why? Whether we're talking about observability or social norms, the key idea that these social interventions leverage is that people are motivated to do good, consciously or subconsciously, because of the kudos they get from others. Recognizing this power of reputation concerns is really powerful. For example, it can tell you that those sign-up sheets will work well in settings where neighbors interact a lot and care a lot about what their neighbors think. It's not going to work well in a hostel where people move in and out often. It can even suggest some additional ways you can get folks to do more good. 
You might, for example, try setting defaults, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art does when you first arrive. People who don't want to pay the suggested donation have to announce that in front of everyone else standing in line, which might make them feel like a jerk. Or you might try eliciting public pledges. Billionaires who have signed up to give half their wealth to charity via the giving pledge will also look like jerks if they back out. So the next time you need to get folks to do more good, to conserve water, drive less, or wash their hands, don't forget to leverage their reputations via social interventions. Sometimes, the currency that matters for changing behavior is not measured in dollars and cents, but in the opinions of others. You can read our paper linked below to learn more. Thank you for listening.